Mouthwashing is a 2024 first-person psychological horror game developed by Wrong Organ and published by Critical Reflex. The game follows the five crew members of the freighter ship, the Tolpar, after a mysterious crash leaves them stranded in space, trapped within a supplies dwindle and their sanity slowly wanes. The captain, alive but severely maimed and unable to speak or move, is blamed by the remaining crew for deliberately crashing the ship for reasons unknown as the protagonist Jimmy, the assistant pilot, is left to fill his boots. The game uses a split, non-linear narrative where we flutter between past, present and future as the mystery unfolds. There's also these sick nightmare sections where Jimmy's sanity is at its limits and the game's really popular right now. I can see why with the story being so well constructed, the way it flows being refreshing and just how dark it is, you know, just like mouthwash. Gameplay is that typical amnesia walking sim type gameplay. This loop does change throughout with various different unique gameplay loops in certain chapters, ranging from puzzle solving, dialogue hunting and navigating some very unique enemy encounters. There's not too much to touch on gameplay wise as it mainly serves as a vehicle for the narrative, with only a few sections asking for anything more than the basics from the player. Gameplay received mixed reviews from the critics saying either the puzzles were simple but fun or that they were annoying, non-challenging. I found the game fun throughout and parts of it very jumpy. It's a good horror game, it's a good psychological thriller. The characters are really where the game shines with a colourful cast all memorable in their own right. There's Jimmy the co-pilot who I'll get into later, Curly the former captain who was the glue of the ship before it crashed, probably the most virtuous of our cast, reduced to bandages and nubs, the medic Anya who is troubled receiving the blunt of the flat from her male colleagues, uh, Swansea the old cynical and formerly sober mechanic and Daisuke, the mechanic intern who can't seem to do anything right, though his heart is in the right place. The graphics are very new low poly, which I feel has been quite popular in the horror scene as of late. The ship itself is this creaking, cramped, retro style ship that harkens to settings such as Alien, where capitalism's won out against its employees. When the ship does open up, it actually makes you more anxious than anything, and the low poly works well with what they do with it, giving the game a claustrophobic, cramped feel, but including a variety of great effects, and sometimes they ditch the low poly for some very specific moments. There's transitions and camera work, and very often you're pulled in very different, surreal versions of the ship, or different Geiger-esque horror settings in very smart ways. I can see how some people would find certain chapters repetitive, but again, I found it fun. And the details hidden within such you know, posters, character comments, or company issue merchandise just kept me exploring the ship. The sound design is very, very good. The cast is unvoiced, but the music and various diegetic sounds from the ship make up for this, helping to heighten the atmosphere. I'm going to play to you two different scenes here, one from a nightmare section and one from when the crew are getting along, just to see how they compare. The way this game juxtaposes these sorts of scenes together makes for a really great balance for this sort of game. We're going to get into the story here and there'll be full spoilers from this point. If you don't want those, feel free to skip to 3420. Otherwise, we're getting into it. The game's exceptionally dark and brutal, and so if that's not your jam, you need a trigger warning for any sort of SA, violence, substance abuse, ETC, then look away now. You've been warned. This game is very dark, contains a lot of dark themes. Uh, there's your warning. Before we even get into the game, look at how rough the menu screen is. We've got a fun ride ahead of us. We're aboard the Pony Express long haul freighter, the Tolpar, on a flight that's meant to take 382 days, just over a year, and we're only halfway through. Text under this exposition reads, I hope this hurts. We open to zero days before the crash. We're an unnamed pilot with a warning there's an asteroid just shy to the left of us. Against a warning, we're going to direct the ship into it. We're not given a chance to avoid it, there's no other option. Uh, but luckily, the ship's autopilot helps steer us away. I should have said that would be lucky, as we take the emergency key and just full send the ship into the asteroid anyway. 
With mere minutes before the crash, we leave the cockpit into a variety of rather cramped hallway tunnels. Each room contains more posters than the last. As we start hitting new corners and turning around, it's clear it all isn't as it seems. We double back and double back again until we're faced with a warped version of the ship's mascot. Then we skip two months ahead, after the crash. We see three of our five man crew, Swansea, Anya and Daisuke. Swansea's telling us to stay away from the cargo as our pay would be dropped if we broke in. Anya's saying it could contain medical supplies and Daisuke's pretty lax about wanting to look, not seeming to care about any consequence. Jimmy says there should be an emergency way in and with the captain incapacitated, he's the captain now. We start our hunt for the code scanner. It's a captain only item to get in and I was getting SS13 vibes by this point. I enjoyed examining the company posters around and seeing more about the business itself. Basically, any late deliveries, any poor teamwork or any medical accidents all get docked from employee pay. It's that level of Wayland yutani that we've seen in other sci-fi settings. These posters also foreshadow things to come. But enough of the prophecy, we've got a scanner to find. Now the ship is a right state, covered in expanding foam that keeps the atmosphere in after the crash. This foam of course makes the place even more cramped and shows the extent of the damage the crash caused. We could speak to our colleagues in different scenes and I'd recommend you do. The characters are a real highlight of this game, each having their own personalities which I feel were quite well written. Maybe minus Anya who just didn't get a lot of love. For instance, in this scene, if we talk to Daisuke, he offers to play rock, paper, scissors with us for the last chicken noodle soup. The rations are running a bit dry. He expresses missing his mum, and if they can break into the hold, he's looking for food. Speaking to Anya, she's all flinchy, showing the crash has took a bit of a toll on her. She showers us in praise, eventually asking us to help with the captain. Oh, this is our first time seeing the captain, isn't it? He's a burnt little nugget after the events of the crash. He's alive, but kept on painkillers daily. I'm not sure I could really call it being alive. Uh, Anya needs our help to give the captain his meds because she hates the noise he makes and well, have a listen. Gruesome, right? The tall power is in a bad way and the crew are holding on by their fingertips. This is a bleak scenario for anyone stranded in space with dwindling supplies. If we speak to the mechanic Swansea, he's guarding the utility bay. It's basically now a solid room of foam and he won't let anyone in at risk for depressurizing the rest of the ship. He also expresses that he misses his kids back on wherever they're from. The code scanner is in the cockpit. It's essentially just a UV torch we can hover over things to reveal codes only the captain should have. The first code you'll find is for a missing protection kit, it's for a gun, but the kit's missing. We're heading back to the cargo bay now so we can open it up. The crew are waiting outside for us and this is a real last ditch effort for them. The whole implication is that our pay is going to be gone if we break in, but the food's running out. Going in the game glitches out and we arrive seven days before the crash, playing as Curly now. The game flip-flops between different times, both before and after the crash, and between Curly and Jimmy himself, hopefully shedding some insight into the actual crash. Curly, in this instance, has passed his psych evaluation, something that Anya, as the crew's doctor, has to administer to all of her colleagues. She seems quite normal compared to, you know, post-crash Anya, and she says there's only one eval left to do, Jimmy's one. Now, he's been giving false answers to Anya and not taking the thing seriously, saying things like, I found myself excited at the sight of cartoon horses, and she has to put that in her report. Swansea had also given us a note saying that they can't expect him to perform miracles, so it looks like we've got a busy day being captain. 
Jimmy's waiting outside the utility bay and turns out Daisuke was a last minute addition to the crew. He's there to help Swansea and Jimmy's asking us to help Swansea before we do anything. Daisuke has set off some of the expanding foam trying to assist Swansea with a broken vent, something that Swansea really fucking hates. We need to get an axe out and gently carve Daisuke free. Swansea and Daisuke have a strained relationship at best. Swansea's a bit too long in the tooth and Daisuke's useless as a technician. We get him out and hand the axe over to the technicians and then we go to Jimmy. When we head to the cockpit, things start to get a bit weird. The tunnel's turning into a falling pit of blood and emergency signs, wreckage all around us. This game's full of these surreal nightmare segments they pepper in just when you start to get comfortable. And I mean, have a look. Tell me this doesn't put you on edge. It ends as soon as it starts, with us entering the cockpit and all returning to normal, without anyone saying anything. Turns out Jimmy and Curly knew each other off ship, and Curly expresses his uncertainty with his career choices. He's at the top of his ladder, he's just not sure if he's climbing the right one. Jimmy's in the opposite position, at the bottom rung, you know, below Curly, and he's jealous of Curly's status. We get news from corporate, but before we can read it, we're in another room. No time given, just text splashing in front of us to take responsibility. We don't have anything in our inventory, and it's not clear if we're Curly or Jimmy. We seem to be in a nightmare version of Cargo with a TV in front of us, and there's various channels giving us a retro Disney feel. Once we've watched all the propaganda about working life and the discovery of atomic power, we get a lovely advertisement for mouthwash with the music getting all happy. We're back to two months later and the advert suddenly makes sense. We're transporting millions of bottles of mouthwash, too sugary to be a disinfectant, with a high enough ethanol content that Swansea can break his sober streak. 15 years gone just like that. The developers actually toyed with making it mouthwash or something else like alcohol, but in the end they chose mouthwash. It's one of the more bleaker items you could be stuck with. You know, everything tastes like blue for the next few months. Anya's the first to show cracks and our faces in our hands. As soon as the reveal comes, we're back to six days before the crash, as Curly ready to show the crew what the news was. If we check our inventory, we can't read the note directly, but we can get Curly's input. He says after six years, just like that, so it must be bad news. We enter the living quarters intending to tell the crew the bad news, but as soon as we open the door, they're trying to throw us a birthday party. Apparently there's one party per hall and it was our turn. We're the only ones with clearance to actually make a birthday cake, and boy is it a punch in the gut. We're about to break some hearts with the news and they're celebrating. Making the cake requires us to input some codes into the food dispenser and mix together different goopy corporate pouches of water, gelatin and sweetener. You can find the codes for these on a menu, but only the captain scanner can give us the code for sweetener. The puzzles in this game are all relatively simple. Mix the packs together and we can bake a cake. We sit down with the crew and when asked to make a speech, we tell them all the bad news. We'll get paid for this delivery, but the company's gone bust, so there's uncertainty about what comes after. There's no more jobs after this one. Who knows if anyone can get employed? Anya never got into medical school, Swansea's too old for a new job. Curly and Daisuke are probably the only ones that will make it out unscathed, and Jimmy lets us know this in quite a scathing review. Anya takes this news the worst, showing a similar reaction to when we found the mouthwash. We slice the cake and then we're three months after the crash. Jimmy decides to check on Curly. Anya and Swansea are both missing at this point. There's only a handful of painkillers left and we don't know if Curly's had any today, so we need to find Anya first. Throughout this whole section we can hear Curly's gasps of pain throughout the ship and I'm sure that's been good for everyone's morale.
Anya and Swansea are both in the cockpit. Anya's been crying, Swansea's taken to carrying the axe around, and we're not sure what the two have been talking about. Entering the room just as Anya says, I understand, if that's how it has to be, but no more context than that. Are they plotting against us? Do they know something we don't know? We're not sure. If we go back to the lounge, we can actually see the rations machine's been cut open with an axe, showing resources are dwindling. Jimmy goes to give Curly his medicine, ranting that he knows what everyone's thinking and worrying what Anya would do if she spoke out. It's all a bit confusing, but something had happened in the time we'd skipped. We give Curly his meds and more of that awful sobbing and groaning from him, and then we're in a nightmare version of the cake party with just us and Curly. Curly gives us a speech about life being a slog, there's good points and bad points, but at least you can enjoy cake with a good friend. We have to search for a knife, and the ship's barely lit at this point, with us traipsing through dark corridors. All the screens have Curly's eye staring through us. We get the axe and head back to him. He's laying on the table replacing the cake, and when we go to quote-unquote feast, it skips to four months after the crash. Captain Jimmy decides to check on the crew. Daisuke's laying on the floor sick from trying to get drunk off the mouthwash, and he's regretting taking the internship his mum found for him. Swansea's dancing in front of the day screen, and the radio's been playing the same playlist on repeat since they started the journey. He's angry that Curly crashed the ship, and he's clearly off his tits on the mouthwash. Anya's staring at a bottle, saying it wouldn't fix anything if she drank it, but she was considering it. Apparently there's some medicine in a compartment just next to the med bay. It's not too encrusted in foam, so we might be able to get to it without endangering the ship. Swansea embeds the axe in the screen behind him when we ask for it. We manage to get the meds, taking a bottle of isopropyl alcohol as well and once again giving Curly his pills. Jimmy actually blows up at Anya at her requesting we give him the pills, saying he's tired of her sentimentality, that he's trying to fix things, he's getting us through this, he's bearing it all as the captain. He has to take responsibility. We send Anya to go and check on Daisuke, and weirdly, if you check the ship, she's not with him. In fact, you can't find her anywhere. It's almost like she's moving at the same time as us, avoiding us. We promise to get Curly through this as we give him his meds. Then we get a new time. The time reads six hours before judgement. That's not ominous at all. Swansea's actually trying to break into the cockpit and we have to secure the door in this quite fast-paced scene. Fuck, if only the gun was still here, right? We tie up the door, lock it, and weirdly in our inventory there's a hidden item. Mousing over it says, my hands won't stop shaking, so we don't know what's happened. We pull off a metal pipe and then Swansea's about to enter the room, and we're back to two days before the crash. Curly's talking to Anya. She can't sleep and neither can he. In her restless moments, Anya comes to look at the screen. Something's clearly troubling her. It's quite a touching moment given all the chaos and again it disappears as we skip to five months after the crash this time. Anya's locked herself in the med bay. The door isn't stuck and she's done it on purpose. We ask her to come out and she says we were right all along, that she should have done this from the start. She believed our worst moments didn't make us into monsters and that she didn't want this. This isn't her worst moment, she says. It's the best decision she'll ever make. What the hell is she about to take care of? Is she going to kill Curly? The only way into the med bay now is through a busted vent that Daisuke once failed to fix. It's in a utility room, which means, you know, a big block of foam. Swansea, of course, isn't about to let us in. Then we skip to eight hours until judgment, with Daisuke covered in blood and on the verge of death. Buckle up, buckaroos. Jimmy's saying he can fix things, and Swansea isn't buying it. 
And remember, in two hours' time, Swansea's going to be swinging that axe at us. The isopropyl alcohol, the disinfectant that would probably save Daisuke now, we used it for a cocktail in the past, I imagine to get past Swansea. We need to find some sort of disinfectant, anything to save Daisuke. All that's left in the ship is bloody mouthwash. If we head into the medical bay, the screen glitches in a certain way where we can't see anything in one corner. Jimmy's refusing to look at something and it's uncertain whether it's Curly, whether it's Anya or a combination. It seems, however in the missing time, we got through the vent in the past. There's no sign of Anya or Curly though. We head to the cargo bay to get the one thing we know can't work but is worth a shot. Trying to head anywhere else just has a screen popping up telling us to take responsibility. The cargo bay has become a nightmare version, a long dark staircase covered in blood and if we shine the little code scanner down the stairs we can see that. Horrid screams ring out from deeper in. We eventually reach a platform with a single note, a warning that a blind beast, aimless and restless, you can't run from it is about. Something's in here with us. We're on a metal walkway making noise at every step and this is actually a stealth section which you can find out very quickly if you start making noise. Something invisible is moving around cargo, following us, making too much noise and well. You're given a warning to be quiet. You need to move around and whenever the creature starts to move you stop. It's restless enough that it will move away and you rinse repeat. I found the whole section quite tense, reminding me of the amnesia games with the water monster. We get a bottle of mouthwash, use it on Daisuke hearing screams after, and then we're where we left off five months after the crash. Weirdly, following the thread backwards, we know to make a cocktail to incapacitate Swansea. We mix mouthwash and isopropyl because the food dispenser is out of action. If you look at the recipe bit on the wall, it's actually got that sort of scribbled on there. We need a sweetener packet, which luckily Daisuke had been hiding in his sleeping bag. With the cocktail made, we give it to him under the guise of making friends. Now, Swansea has some firm but kind words to Daisuke, complaining that someone sent him here to be surrounded by sad sack adults, implying his youth is something special that he shouldn't waste. Going into the utility bay, it turns out it's not a room full of foam. The foam had blocked off all but one cryostasis pod. Once the food had run out, Swansea would have hidden it, safe for 20 years at least while the rest of us died. So he was going to save himself while everyone else died. He blocked off the room under the guise it was full of foam, just so that he could get his ticket out. Daisuke goes into the vent and well, we know how that one ends. Uh, but Anya's done something and we're not sure what yet. One day before the crash, Curly's looking for the gun. Now we know Anya's hidden it somewhere if we examine the environment around us. Curly mentions that. It's the gun that was missing from the cockpit this whole time. When we speak to her, we realise she never got psyche evals and we're worried she took the gun to hurt herself. She's the crew's doctor, so there isn't someone to give her an evaluation. Curly reassures her that he'd do anything for his crew and she confides in us that she took the gun because she's pregnant. Curly says he can fix it, we find out that Jimmy's responsible, somehow, and it's implied forcefully. She hid the gun to prevent Jimmy getting a hold of it. No wonder she's so flinchy around him in the present. 
bathing him in praise. She's terrified of Jimmy, what he's capable of, what he did to her. She doesn't sleep in the communal area out of fear or do something again. It turns out he wasn't the good guy we thought he was. Six hours until judgement. Two hours after we gave Daisuke the mouthwash. We, we can't stop his bleeding, no matter how we tried. His coughs are wet and pained and horrible to listen to. Swansea said that he was a damn good kid trying his best, that an old fool like him could have learnt from him. He asked him to close his eyes and well... With no chance at saving him, Swansea mercy kills him. He calls Jimmy deluded and we confront him about the pod. We accuse him of filling Anya's head full of smoke as well when we caught them talking in the cockpit. And he says that it was Anya telling him things. Swansea knows. He says shouldn't a captain go down with a ship? He tells us to get in the pod and he disappears with the axe. We decide to go and get the gun. If we check the med bay, we can finally see what Anya's done. She overdosed to escape Jimmy. It's brutal, it's ugly, but Curly's still alive. All my homies hate Jimmy. If you saw the code earlier in the game, you can open the case here and now without having to risk going to the cockpit again. Doing so nets you an achievement and Curly begins to laugh at us. He's seen everything. Swansea calls out our name, starts running to the med bay and we skip to zero days before the crash. Anya had told Jimmy she was pregnant. He's walked away, and at this point we can guess what he went to do. If he was going down, we're all going to go down with him. Oh, he sat outside the cockpit. Curly says he can fix the situation, saying they can fix it together. He knows Jimmy. Jimmy's been through similar hard times, and there must be a rational explanation or a way out. But Jimmy wants it to be remembered as a tragedy, to save his reputation and Curly's. Jimmy says he'll take care of it, and as he enters the cockpit, he goes to crash the ship. Well, Curly's stunned. I imagine stunned entirely that someone he knew could do this. He doesn't even notice when Jimmy goes to the cockpit. Eventually, he does clock on and runs to avert the madness, pulling the ship off course enough that everyone can survive. Hence why he was the most injured, and hence why the rest of the crew think he did it. Jimmy was the one who spun the narrative. We skip ahead an hour before judgement. No Swansea, no Anya, and no Daisuke. We take Curly into the lounge. All the dead members of the crew sat round with party hats on, clapping, a horrible nightmare version of the birthday party. Daisuke's axe, Swansea's shot, and Anya's od We then carve a chunk off of Curly. The food obviously must have run out by this point. Plates full of leg are just surrounding us as we enter a nightmare version of the vents.
we're given a warning there's no turning back now. Navigate the vents to enter a graveyard and an encounter by Axeman Swansea. Memorials to the different members of the crew are here. Swansea sneaks around and runs if we see him. We have to shoot him before he can access and the encounter is very well done. I found it a lot of fun and very spooky just seeing him in the corner of my eye sneaking about nearly getting to us. One bullet isn't enough and you have to actually get him three times, it's very slippy. The environment not helping one bit, breaking line of sight between you both. It's very tense as you can see here. When the encounters are done, we see Swansea's final moments. He's got something to say and he's going to make sure Jimmy hears it as he gives us a speech about how his 13 years of drunkenness were the best days of his life. That he achieved so much that everyone else would want, a family, a good job, but none of it felt good. He regrets his life choices entirely and this whole game is encompassed in that theme of regret, whether it's life choices, mistakes, murder, all of it. With Swansea gone, we're left to take responsibility, whatever that means. The ship warps through various nightmare forms, including Curly's ever watchful eyes and meat all over the walls. Jimmy's sanity was slipping before, but now it's well and truly gone. We have a weird pipe puzzle as we adjust Curly's innards on screen. Jimmy actually fed Curly some of his own leg for his survival. It's grim, horrible, and so, so dark. We have one last conversation with Curly as the burning martyr himself wants to claim responsibility for what Jimmy did. Curly was a captain and he should have seen it happen, he should have prevented it. Jimmy takes the responsibility that it was all his fault, nobody forced him to do the horrid and depraved things he did. We have a weird ultrasound section where we have to find horses in this giant heart thing. Of course when we find them we then start to hear the cries of a child and it's not a heart, it's some sort of embryo. The one Jimmy was responsible for with, with Anya. We're chased by a combination of it and the horse mascot through the nightmare vents. There's an infinite number of turns and corridors and if it sees us, it'll rush towards us. We need to avoid it taking every turn we can. It'll poke its head around a corner and then dash forward, so you've got to be ahead of it. I found the section quite high octane, even how simple it was in retrospect, just turning corners. Eventually, running through a corridor filled with the ID cards of people we killed. Jimmy's last act is putting Curly in the cryopod and finishing himself off. His idea of fixing it and taking responsibility was making sure Curly survived. Curly's fate is unclear and we've not received rescue yet, it's been months after the, the hall was meant to finish. But at least he's guaranteed 20 years of safety in the pod. Maybe he makes it, maybe he doesn't. Jimmy took responsibility in the biggest way he could, ending himself after all the damage he caused. He crashed the ship, he assaulted Anya, killed his crewmates and did horrid things when the food ran out. With that nightmare of a trip finished and Curly's ever watchful eye seeing it all, what did I think? Story-wise, the game grapples with some very dark and strong themes in a very nuanced way with some unique storytelling. It was a two hour trip for me and most players and in those two hours the story is a 10-10. It's horrid, disturbing, hits close to home in some areas with these themes of regret and uncertainty and I just can't compliment it enough. Graphics and sound design were all great. I didn't think taking it out of a low poly style would have improved anything. There's plenty of moments where they do do that intentionally with the monsters and it's very impactful when it happens. Sometimes less is more. The sound design for me from the music to the effects was brutal and horrific and it was great. 10, 10 again, I can't fault that either. I don't think a voice cast would have improved things. I liked how quiet everything was. 
how claustrophobic, and when it got loud, it got tense. Perhaps the ship layout itself could have been played with, but I think the claustrophobic nature of it worked well. There was some variance in the gameplay, but for the most part, it's a walking sim. You do get some unique parts in the loop with different boss encounters, but it's still not amazing. Some of the puzzles are a bit too easy or slightly repetitive, but I did find them fun. The gun section was a highlight for me, and it's clear the gameplay was just a vehicle for the story here. It's not breaking new ground. I'd give it a 6 out of 10, but others would probably vary on that number. I think the puzzles could have been improved on, made a bit more hard perhaps. The gunfight was actually quite unique to the game, but the other bosses were just a walk in this certain way thing. Overall, when we consider the length of 2 hours, the price being a fair 10.99, I think it's worth a punt even at full price. It was exceptionally dark and unique with just a few areas of improvement. Everything ran as it should. I experienced no bugs or glitches and I liked the story experience. I'm giving it a 9 out of 10 overall for what it was. I've seen average reviews hit around 8 to 9 out of 10. And I'm sure some people wouldn't enjoy it and some people would enjoy it more than me. But that's just my opinion. Over and out, smooth brains. Let me see you back it up. Drop that ass down, load it, pick that-